Hello, everyone. You made it to so the Survivors of Geo Congress 2023. I'm Manzar Pejvan. I'm with Jacobs, and I over I lead the Northwest Geography of Geotechnical Engineering Group at Jacobs. I'm here with Kurt today. Kurt, do you want to introduce yourself? Kurt Bassnett. I'm out of our Tampa, Florida office, <clears throat> and uh, I lead the uh, what's called the U.S. South uh, Technology Group for Geotechnical Engineering. So I just. Uh, want to say that we are very proud to be sponsoring the PAC lecture this year. And with that, similar to what Yoga got with the seed lecture, I have the selling point. <laughs> uh, so uh, our, our purpose is to challenge today, reinvent tomorrow, and every single project that we do, we are really focusing on uh, this mission of our company, we are looking to create a more connected and sustainable world. We have our four values that we, I did talk to you in the previous years about examples of how we do the things right, we challenge the accepted, we aim higher, and we truly live inclusion. And this year, I want to talk a little bit about our market solutions. If we can go to the next slide, or I do have the quickly here. So, we do have, um, seven main global markets, and as a geotechnical engineering group, we call it the tunnel and ground engineering group. We are one of the cross markets that we get to work and support advanced facilities, cities and places, energy and power, environment, health, transportation and water. So you can think about old projects that are ranging from dams to ports, high, highways to uh, landfills and airports, all the data centers also and um, all the other exciting projects. If we come to the tunnel and ground engineering group globally, and I will go to the next slide in that one, we do have around 100 geotechs and geosciences within the US, but over the, uh, globally, we do work as a one company, and we have two, 650 geotechs and geosciences that provide subject matter experts in all areas of geotechnical that you can think of, and also tunneling. Kurt, do you want to add anything? Yeah, that's, uh, like Menzer said, uh, you know, geotechnical engineering all over the world, uh, major projects that we're supporting, uh, you know, in, in Panama, in Australia, you name it, we're there. Uh, we're even supporting NASA. With that, thank you, and um, I hope you enjoyed the PAC lecture. Good afternoon, and it is my pleasure and my honor to present uh, the Ralph Peck Award to uh, Dr. Liming Zhang uh, for his contributions to risk-informed decision in geotechnical design. Dr. Zhang is chair professor and head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and director of Geotechnical Centrifuge Facility at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His research areas include slopes, dams, foundations, and geotechnical risk assessment and management. Dr. Zhang is chair of the International Society of Solid Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering's TC210 on embankment dams, past chair of our institute's risk assessment and management committee, uh, editor-in-chief of, of the journal GeoRisk, associate editor, editor of our journal of geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering, and he is a board member uh, in the editorial um, of the uh, Engineering Geology, Computers, and Geotechnics, and several other journals. So, of course, uh, we all know of Dr. Zhang's uh, work, uh, but what is really something to, um, I would like to emphasize is his dedication to service. 
Um, if you look at how many other committees he has uh, led or participated or promoted, it's very impressive. Um, the other thing that it's in the spirit of uh, Ralph Beck's uh, ingen ingenuity and innovation is that uh, he approaches whatever problem he works on, whether it is reliability and risk of pile foundations for bridges, or if it's a centrifuge problem, or whatever it is, he has a very global view of risk. And that, I think, is very important. And it, it shows true leadership from a geo uh, a professional uh, for something that we can all benefit from, similar to the GOP talk that we just heard, where you need to look at infrastructure holistically and understand the risk. So I think um, the, 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 our engineering is turning into risk-informed decisions rather than a one-way street of one solution. So um, that, I think, um, is a major contribution of Dr. Zhang, and it is my, uh, really my honor to um, present to you the Ralph Peck Award. Thank you so much, CC, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so honored and humbled to present the 25th PAC lecture. I'm from Hong Kong, China. I have been an AAC international member for more than 25 years. Um, probably you don't know uh, the AAC Hong Kong international section it's the largest AAC's international chapter overseas. <laughs> so this award uh, means a lot to me and also to, I believe, uh, AAC's international members and communities uh, outside the US. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my uh, former and current students, colleagues, and collaborators for the contribution to the case studies I'm going to present today. Uh, also not least, uh, my wife, uh, daughter, and son are also in LA today to witness this special moment. Dr. Park is engineer, educator, and a man of judgment. In the past many years, I've been learning his learn as you go and observation observational method approach. He's my role model in geotechnical decision and judgment. Today, my, the theme of my lecture is risk-informed decision in the face of extreme natural hazard chains. I will first present the concept of hazard chain and risk, then present three cases in which risk-informed decisions are made differently, a bit passively in the first case, proactively in the second case, and uh, futuristically in the third case. So case one deals with highway risk construction in the epicentral area of the Wintron earthquake in 2008. Case two deals with Yangtze River diamond risk which happened in 2018. And case three deals with stress testing of the railway risk when it is exposed to glacier risk. All the three cases are located in Western China. I used to study and work in Chengdu, Sichuan province. I believe you know where the Sichuan, at least you have tasted Sichuan food everywhere. So in the last 15 years or so, uh, my research team have made at least 30 plus field trips to the three sites I present today. Uh, 
um, well, particularly um, my parents-in-law, I once lived in Zhujiang Yan City, uh, which is just about 20 kilometers away from the epicenter of the Wenchuan earthquake. During the earthquake, uh, the flood was severely damaged. Uh, therefore, research on uh, reconstruction of that area uh, indeed has special interest to me. So in the presentation, case one covers the first three topics and will take a little bit longer uh, than the rest two topics. So in Deep Valley, if a landslide happened at the top of the mountain, so what happened? So the material will run down as avalanche. So during a storm, the material may turn into debris flow, so which may enter river system, or form a landslide dam. If the dam breaches, then the uh, dam breaching flood will travel much longer, longer. So a series of hazards like this form a so what we call hazard chain. So the point one form of hazard transformed to another is called a hazard escalation point. And the point, the risk escalate, uh, of course, naturally called a risk escalation point. During a strong earthquake or larger rainstorm, numerous hazard chains like this can form, which will be illustrated uh, in case one. So the winter earthquake uh, with a magnitude of eight happened in May 2008. Uh, the epicenter is located at Yinsu town with about 10,000 uh, residents. So during the earthquake, uh, the major highways in the epicentral area were almost completely damaged. So shortly after the earthquake, uh, the re reconstruction of the highway system started. Uh, the highway from the epicenter Yinshu to Wenchuan, uh, 54 kilometers long, was started immediately in May 2008. And the other highway from Yinshu to uh, Wulong, uh, which basically is the, uh, the location, the Grand Panda Conservation uh, Park is located. So that one was started in April 2009. Uh, so the reconstruction of that 45-kilometer highway, or State Highway 303, was financially sponsored by the uh, Hong Kong government. Uh, that's why then our team were invited to follow up all the construction process. Today, we're going to focus on the first 18-kilometer uh, highway between two earthquake faults. So look at a lot of landslides, or in fact, about 35% of terrain uh, is covered by landslide debris. So go into the valley, uh, so the highway runs along the bottom of the valley and along the river. So during the earthquake, again, a lot of landslide occur, and the landslide debris uh, was retained on the deep terrains of, uh, of the mountain. Uh, Along the highway, uh, roughly 80% uh, of landslide happened between uh, 400 and 1,200 meters above the highway line. Uh, so you can imagine uh, the chance to stabilize the slope is really little. Just imagine 1,000 meters above. But from that picture, you can imagine what can happen if a rainstorm hit the area. So, this material basically uh, was at a kind of pseudo-static location, uh, limited state almost. Um, so those are damages to the highway. And so the reconstruction started April 2009, uh, a few months after the earthquake. Uh, in the early period of highway reconstruction, uh, the main types of hazards were uh, rock falls, landslide, Landslide happen with a little rain or after a long dry day, which you can imagine from well, kind of on such a soil mechanics principle. By August 2010, uh, the road bed work have nearly completed. Uh, then came the first rainstorm after the earthquake. That rainstorm triggered numerous reduced landslide debris flow. Uh, you may just find one catchment starting from elevation around 3,000 meters, 
So land slide happened, and the land slide material run down, uh, entered strain, channelized, become channeled like double flow. Then numerous double flow merge, merge, become bigger double flow. And uh, for the one uh, at the bottom, uh, the volume of double flow reach about 1.2 million cubic meter. And from that picture, you can also see uh, many, many catchment, each catchment basically a chain of hazard. So, which means uh, in a larger storm, there are basically numerous hazard chains like that can form. So the largest, largest scale double flow uh, basically uh, fill up tunnel just completed. So tunnel portal buried. Um, so large landslide dam formed. Okay, landslide lake developed. Uh, construction facility buried. Similar large scale landslide and debris flow occur again and again, 2011, 2013, both along State Road 303 and along the highway from Jinsu to Wenchuan. Dreamed the larger scale. So, so after just two or three years' time, so what happened? Um, the highway, which was just, and the tunnel became a water tunnel. So 15 meter rise uh, already. So at that time, there was a big concern, well, how much the riverbed will continue to, to rise? Uh, so in the second round of reconstruction, uh, the tunnel was not utilized. So basically, it's an engineering failure. But then you look at, oh, what caused the failure? Definitely, it is not structure safety issues. Stability-wise, perfect. So the failure was caused by unexpected reasons, which is uh, significant rising of the river system. Uh, dredging doesn't work because uh, well, the riverbed basically rose everywhere. It's not just a local location. So we kept, monitor, uh, kept monitoring the elevation change. Uh, so the riverbed kept uh, rising, rising, rising. Uh, then in 2015, uh, the riverbed start to uh, go down. So year 2015 is a turning point of the hazard chain life cycle. Of course, we never expect the, the, well, the, uh, the natural system will return to uh, that uh, exist before the earthquake. Uh, in fact, uh, even up to today, about 80% of landslide debris still return on the mountainside. So some lesson learned. The first round of highway reconstruction over there was not so successful due to insufficient understanding of the hazard chains after a strong earthquake. So in the last decade, we observed significant engineering failures arising from hazard chains or arising from unexpected design scenarios. We also learned uh, how the natural uh, hazard chain evolved over time. So we noted the impact space time of the hazard chain uh, are much larger than those of just a single hazard or lead hazard. So the first round of reconstruction uh, was not really smooth. So, and then the second round of reconstruction started in 2012. So in the second round, it was decided to adopt a risk-informed decision. So because of that, it is necessary to answer some well, basic questions of risk assessment, uh, like what can go wrong, uh, what is the likelihood that it will go wrong, and so what are the consequences if something goes wrong, and finally, uh, what we can do to mitigate uh, the risk. Risk is, in general, defined as consequence, uh, either uh, societal risk or individual risk. So simply put, the annualized risk R may be expressed as a product of annualized probability failure H, degree of damage or vulnerability V, and element of risk E. Once we have analyzed the risk, uh, so what we need to do next is to assess whether the risk level is acceptable or not. If not, then 
some measures, some engineering must, must be taken to uh, mitigate the risk. It would be convenient to express risk on a f n plot, uh, f annualized frequency and n uh, number of building damage or number of fatality. Um, so on our fn curve, the tolerable risk can be expressed uh, explicitly. Uh, now for this highway system, suppose the initial risk is too high, what we can do? Uh, now always remember R is product of HVE. So we can mitigate, we can reduce the risk by reducing any of HVE or some of them. Uh, for instance, we can reduce risk by reducing probability failure by uh, slope stabilization. But unfortunately for that particular case, you can see a lot of slopes are higher, kilometer high, uh, so the chance is quite limited. We can reduce the risk by constructing some protection walls or barriers uh, which can reduce uh, vulnerability and reduce the exposure, E. Yeah. Or we can use a landslide warning system to reduce the element risk in case of uh, earthquake or storm. If all those do not work out, well, what we can do, yeah, we can bypass the major hazard, which we can always do. So the past few years, we developed a prompt landslide risk assessment uh, program or polar. Uh, by the way, uh, it just appeared in JTT uh, recently. Uh, so in this uh, assessment platform, we will establish probability distributions of current probability, magnitude, uh, mobility, and the impact of landslides, and then uh, assess the risk almost uh, real time. Uh, so this example, uh, so we put entire Hong Kong with a land area of about 1,100 square kilometers as a study area. So when a particular rainstorm hit this area, so as um, the rainfall uh, evolve, so we can estimate where landslide can happen, magnitude of landslide, so how many what buildings could be affected, and then real-time risk. So we present uh, the risk uh, concisely uh, on one page, similar to USGS page for earthquake risk assessment. Uh, since calculation is fast, therefore the one page uh, summary or poster can be updated uh, once a few minutes. Of course, when we deal with lenders that has a chain, many hazards are involved, H1, H2, H3. Uh, so in assessing risk of such hazard chains, it is necessary to consider dependencies of a hazard and dependency of uh, vulnerabilities to the hazards. If we miss some important hazard scenario, then the risk could be well, um, seriously underestimated. So uh, a little bit earlier, I have mentioned the story of Bohemia Tunnel. Remember, okay, that tunnel got a problem due to, uh, due to missing the consideration of an important scenario, which is a rising uh, riverbed. So let me take another example uh, to illustrate the importance of dependencies. Uh, so that is a little town, again, uh, 10,000 people resident before the earthquake, which is the epicenter of the winter earthquake in Seoul. So majority of buildings were destroyed uh, during earthquake. So shortly after the earthquake, in about two years, uh, that town was rebuilt. Uh, now, uh, let me ask a question. Can land a slide four kilometers away on the other side of the Minjiang River? Minjiang River is a larger river. So would those uh, land slide four kilometers away affect the town across the larger river? Intuition probably, mm, probably not, but the reality, yes. So what happened? Um, so during the first rainstorm, again, uh, in August 2010, uh, those land slide debris uh, reactivated during the storm, turned into that channel of debris flow, entered the Minjiang River. As you can see then forced the river course to the new town, which was just, just reconstructed, but fortunately not yet um, 
not, uh, not yet uh, inhabited. Uh, people have not yet moved in at that time, but that time was seriously flooded due to what we call dependencies of uh, hazards or hazard inter interactions. So without considering such spatial cases could, uh, again, ser seriously underestimate the risk level. So we propose a five-phase five multi-hazard risk analysis procedure. So in this procedure, we try, try hard to analyze possible a chain event from H1, H2, H3, or consider possible interactions among some of the hazard. Also, when identifying so-called element risk, we try to try hard to find element, elements which could be impacted during, well, during the lifetime of a hazard chain and in, in the space covered by the hazard chain. Of course, it's not so easy to identify uh, hazard interactions or uh, unexpected hazard. Uh, but in any case, uh, numerical modeling sometimes help. For instance, uh, we developed program ADA2, uh, which may be used, used to uh, simulate hazard interaction and po possible hazard interactions uh, in extreme events. So I take home question for you. Uh, in assessing the hazard chain risk, should we consider the hazard chain as a numerous individual events or a single big event which lasts for a certain period of time? The answer relies on you. Now the second round of construction started in uh, 2012. Uh, so in the second round, uh, we adopted the risk-informed decision uh, method. Uh, now I'd like to, uh, to uh, illustrate how risk, so-called risk-informed decision uh, was made. So first, uh, again, in the first 18 kilometers of the road, we identify three and five major earthquake-induced landslide soil deposit. Uh, we analyze the risk of this deposit and rank the risk of them. Uh, so those are, those are the top 20, 25 uh, high risk uh, deposit. You can find out that some of soil deposit are the low in elevation, which may be stabilized or removed, but majority of them are at high elevation, which remind us some, some protective measures must be taken. So quite a few uh, shelter tunnel, that is not really a tunnel, but just for shelter, rock for shelter. Shelter tunnel and the flexible barriers have been constructed. Uh, so once something's there, we assume the vulnerability would be de decreased. Uh, but uh, those protection measures may not be truly effective. Considering, look at the big rock behind me, a huge rock falling down from about 500 meters. Just imagine uh, some conventional protection measures uh, would not be sufficient to, to well, really to protect people against such a kind of rockfall. So in the construction, uh, the 21 major soil deposits were, de were cleaned, but not the high one. Now if we analyze the risk profiles again, uh, Initially, the risk level is high. Uh, after cleaning the 21 soil deposit, risk level is still really high. After constructing some barrier and short tunnels, the risk level decreased somewhat, but still extremely high. I believe such kind of outcome is consistent with what, we, what happened. Well, in fact, uh, majority of new highway uh, indeed was destroyed. Uh, so that's, that's not strange. Uh, we need to be aware that uh, the conventional design using fact of safety does not truly reflect uh, the risk profile. Therefore, a lot of times, risk-informed decision is really necessary and is not a redundant portion uh, the beyond the fact of safety approach. So facing such a high uh, risk level, what do we do? Um, so we decide, of course, the designer, we just work with designer, decided to use long tunnels to bypass the high risk area 
So what we, do, what we help is we classify uh, the risk levels of a highway into several uh, reaches of highway, and then propose three uh, tunnel alignments to bypass uh, the high-risk areas. So through some uh, cost-benefit analysis, uh, the tunnel scheme K uh, was adopted. Also, a landslide a warning system was installed, uh, which aimed to, again, to reduce element risk in case of uh, landslide. Now with the two new measures, first of all with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, tunnel, uh, so the risk level is in indeed reduced greatly. So the res residual risk is mainly occurred due to the portion of the highway, open, open highway. And uh, so with, uh, with the use of the landslide warning system, the risk level can be further uh, decreased. The benefit of quantified risk analysis or quantitative risk analysis is the ability to compare the effectiveness of all possible risk mitigation measures. So start from zero, individual risk, beginning high risk, cleaning of the soil deposit decrease somewhat, barriers decrease somewhat, but with the tunnel plan, the risk level has been greatly decreased. The second decision pro issue facing us is, again, the significant rising of uh, the river system. Therefore, we need to, well, in the second round of construction, we need to determine a new elevation of the highway alignment. Uh, so how much we should raise uh, the elevation? So this is somewhat de dependent on how much uh, landslide material will enter the river system. Um, so for that purpose, we studied uh, the mass movement along the highway. Uh, for some very active uh, catchment, like a pool catchment, you can see, first of all, at the beginning, we got a certain amount of hill slope, soil deposit. Uh, then every landslide, some material run down and become a uh, valley deposit. So over time, the amount of uh, hill slope uh, soil deposit decreases, but the valley deposit increases. We observe that the largest mass movement ratio in one event is about 28%. So we recommend um, to use a 30% of reactive ratio, okay, reactive ratio to determine uh, the river, possible river rise. Also based on observation, uh, and then finally, it was decided to raise the highway alignment by 10 to 15 meters in general, and over 20 meters in some active debris flow regions. So this recommendation uh, is shown to be safe. For instance, uh, so in, in December 2012, uh, so when the new tunnel was about to start, you can see the tunnel was quite some distance from the river system. But then next summer, after one flood season, well, the, the river bed rose again. And, but however, the new uh, river surface is still a few meters below the new tunnel line. So finally, uh, the highway, uh, the second round of highway reconstruction was completed in October. Uh, 2016. Certainly, we do not expect to ask every engineer uh, to conduct complicated probabilistic analysis. Instead, uh, we summarize the risk principle uh, in engineer's language. Uh, for instance, mitigate hazard chain risk, uh, bypass major hazard, raise highway alignment, and be reasonably practical. Or in Chinese, it can be made more, more concise. So that's the end of case one. So in case one, the decision making was a bit passive. Now I'd like to move to case number two, uh, in which uh, the risk informed decision uh, was done at the beginning. In October 2018, about five years ago, a large landslide happened in Tibet along the Jinsha River. Jinsha River is upstream of Yangtze River, the largest river in China. Uh, well, in fact, uh, the left-hand side is Tibet, and the right-hand side is Sichuan Province. So this landslide blocked the Yangtze River. 
or in fact, this is the first time the Yangtze River was completely blocked in the recent history. Uh, so this really created a lot of tension. Uh, so the landslide dam uh, there uh, was about 61 meter high. And it was filled in about one and a half day. At that time, the flow rate was still quite large. And the landslide dam bridge two days after. The dam bridging flow rate reached about 10,000 cubic meter per second. In that region, the probable maximum flood of the river uh, was about 11,000 per cubic, uh, cubic meter per second. So the, then the flood waters uh, marched down and uh, 220 kilometers away, uh, there is a hydropower station which was under construction at that time. Now uh, the water level uh, in the cover dam, upstream cover dam, rose, rose. If that dam bridge, the generated dam bridge and flood would be similar to what just happened two days ago. By the way, it took two days for the flood water to travel about 200 kilometers. Fortunately, so before this dam was about to, to be overtopped, uh, the flood water stopped moving. So uh, this is really a stress test, test to the limit of, a, of the coffee dam. Unfortunately, about two weeks after, another landslide happened at the same spot and formed a dam which, which is much higher, 96 meters. If nothing down, the lake volume would be reached more than uh, 800 million cubic meter, and the risk level will be much higher than the first landslide dam. Now look at a lot larger number of people in downstream, a lot of cascaded dams along the Jinsha River, a lot of bridges and other critical infrastructures. Uh, for sure, the risk level is quite high, and immediate decisions must be made to mitigate the risk. So we involved the case and propose a protocol of managing the risk of land the dam chain, has a chain. Uh, the main step included uh, monitoring, evacuation, dam bridge analysis, flood routine analysis, uh, some dam safety analysis along the way, and uh, then a risk analysis. Certainly it takes time for the flood to arrive at a certain element of risk. However, uh, to conduct successful uh, risk mitigation or evacuation you know, uh, takes time. Yeah, we need time to warn people. We need time for people to respond to warning message and to evacuate. So a successful ev evacuation means that available time is longer than uh, the demand time. So let's walk over a few steps. Uh, first, evacuation monitoring. So once land slab formed, uh, that site was closed, closely monitored, and uh, uh, the residents right above and downstream of the dam were start to be uh, were start to be evacuated. And the second, dam bridge analysis. When the land slab dam just formed, well, the information available was quite limited. Uh, for that reason, then we applied some empirical correlations to estimate possible dam bridging flood. After a few days, after we got more information, then uh, it was possible to adopt a more accurate numerical analysis program, uh, dam bridging analysis program, uh, which can be executed in Excel to conduct analysis. So through such analysis, we, we estimate estimated that if nothing's down, uh, the dam bridging flood rate could reach about 55,000 cubic meter per second, which is a huge. But if a diversion tunnel is excavated and lowers the water level by about 50 meter, then uh, the flow rate can go down to about 35,000 meter cubic meter per second. Well, in fact, we conduct analysis and uh, keep uh, keep releasing our outcome, and the day before the breaching, uh, we basically uh, announced estimate of dam breaching flood between 
29,000 and 35,000 cubic meters per second. We also conducted flood routine analysis. Uh, again, it was found that if nothing's down, uh, then the flood would travel to downstream. Uh, and for about five kilometer, 500 kilometers region, uh, the flood would be greater than a local probable maximum flood. No infrastructure is designed without a flood level. Therefore, a lot of infrastructure will be destroyed. However, if with a 50 meter diversion channel, uh, then uh, the flood level could be reduced quite a bit. We also conducted a risk analysis or identify element of risk, a possible inundation area, and uh, uh, the risk level, which is water depth and the velocity. Uh, so we, we provide this information uh, to the authority. Of course, being a university professor, we only do the analysis and provide information. We don't have authority to make a decision. The decisions are made by uh, relevant authorities, particularly government uh, agencies. So very quick en engineering mitigation measures were performed. Uh, first of all, a diversion channel, uh, which is about 50 meter deep and 220 uh, meter long, was excavated in three days. That lowers the water level uh, by 15 meters. And the second, uh, as we just learned from case one, it is important to avoid risk amplification. I've mentioned the cover dam at Suwalong, uh, 220 kilometers down. Uh, just imagine uh, now we anticipate a much larger flow rate, and this dam must fail. If the dam breaching flood of this one uh, overlap with the uh, upcoming flood, then the risk will be really high. So it, a quick decision was made to remove this coffee dam before the arrival of the main flood. That was done very quickly. And uh, later on, it was, uh, uh, what was shown that this was a correct decision. The real flood level at that uh, flood uh, discharge at that uh, location was about 20,000 cubic meters three times more than the capacity. Also, uh, about 1.3 billion cubic, cubic meter of water in six reservoirs between 700 to 1,000 kilometers away from dam, dam site was released before the arrival of the floodway. Uh, finally, then about 600 million cubic meter of flood water arrived and was completely captured. So finally, after everything has done, which is quite lucky, the dam really breached. And the maximum flow rate reached 33,000 cubic meter per second. So our team, working at the site, taking sample, measures erosion resistivity and other things. So just a quick, quick summary, uh, this is the case uh, in which prompt risk assessment and uh, proactive engineering decisions were made timely, uh, which led to zero fatality, uh, although those are really two major uh, catastrophic traffic and uh, dam failure events. So in this case, um, we have answered satisfactorily uh, two critical questions what can go wrong, and what we can do to reduce the risk. Again, I need to uh, note that the decisions were made by relevant authority. All right, now allow me to move to the third case, stress testing uh, prepare for future extreme events. When we consider extreme events, those are extreme, therefore very rare. So we can never have sufficient cases, sufficient extreme cases, to come with well, statistics, mean, standard deviation, whatever. Uh, therefore, uh, conventional probabilistic analysis is not quite likely. Uh, an effective way to cope with low probability, high consequence event could be stress testing. Well, in fact, stress testing is a routine in the financial industry. So we modify financial 
stress testing to a stress testing for natural hazards. So in the framework, uh, we need to first define the system and define the stress scenario, or you may say load cases. Then uh, evaluate the impact, system response, and the risk under each stress scenario. After that, then we need to consider management strategies, which include, uh, first of all, through testing. Hopefully, we can find out the bottlenecks or the weakness of the system and uh, develop strategies to improve the system performance. After any mitigation measure is proposed, then we need to do one more thing to assess the effectiveness of the proposed strategy and quantify uh, changes in risk profile. Very often, uh, something not so effective is adopted, and the people believe something has been done. But later on, they found out uh, such measure may not be effective. Now I'm happy to bring you to Southeast Tibet, where the most beautiful uh, mountain in the world, uh, Nanjia Bawa, is located. This area uh, is featured by the most active tectonic movements, largest elevation differences, most active geohazard activities, and the most variable climate. Well, in fact, Himalaya mountain is the highest mountain in the world. Uh, but many of you are aware the mountain is only like 20 million years old. Still rising, still moving around very quickly. Let's focus on the Palong Zambu uh, River uh, basin. Well, in fact, the Nanja Bawa mountain is just south of Pong uh, so the new highway will go across this area. Uh, in this area, a lot of larger scale uh, glacier hazards uh, occur quite fre frequently. Uh, for instance, the Guxiang debris flow uh, with a volume of 200 million cubic meters, huge, uh, which happened in 1953. And uh, in year 2000, a large landslide happened at Yigong, and a landslide dam with a volume of about three billion cubic meter form. And at the Pailong Gully, uh, the frequent debris flow happened in the gully. Now, uh, my so called decision problem uh, is how to go across the Pailong Gully. So, last year in April or, uh, 2021, or two years ago, our team spent about two weeks in the area studying. Uh, glacial hazard. Now look at the Pelon Gully. Uh, so the Gully Mouse uh, is at about 2,000 meter elevation, but top of mountain uh, a bit more than 5,000 meter. Uh, Double flows quite active, uh, but not so big, big scale. The major hazard we anticipated are First of all, uh, the dam bridging flood from Yigong Zhangbo River. Uh, remember year 2000, a large landslide happened over there. And another major hazard would be detachment of a glacier in that area. Well, in fact, in the, in the past decade or so, several larger scale collapses or detachment of a glacier hazard happened with a huge volume. Now let's define two extreme hazard scenarios. So scenario number one, or stress case, okay, load case number one, Egon Dam breaching flood. So again, in your 2000 April, a large landslide with a volume of about uh, 300 million cubic meter occurred and which formed a big lake. Uh, to reduce the hazard, an 18 meter deep diversion channel was excavated. And finally, dam breach happened. Uh, the flow rate at the Pelong Gully mouth uh, was about 11, excuse me, not 11,000, uh, 110,000, huge flood at the elevation. And the flood depth um, was about 55 meters. Now, if no excavation, if that 18 meter diversion tunnel was not excavated, 
then the estimated dam breaching flow rate at the location of Pelong Gully would be 250,000 cubic meters. And the fl flood depth would be about 100 meters. So that basically are the responses of the natural system to the hazard scenario. So second scenario, glass glacier detachment at high mountain. Indeed, uh, quite a few detachment uh, cases happened in the last, uh, last decade or so. Uh, some with a detachment length of one kilometer, some two kilometers, some three kilometers. Uh, so we are interested to look to evaluate uh, if a glacier detachment happen and turn into glacier double flow, what are the uh, areas impacted and what are the deposition depths or, or flow depths. So we considered four uh, scenarios, smaller scenarios, one with low, low risk scenario, one kilometer detachment, then two kilometer de detachment, then three kilometer detachment, and finally assume mm, all the valley glacier at the top of mountain detach. Through analysis, we found out in the case of three kilometer and all detachment, uh, so the volume of glacier uh, double flow uh, were deposit at the uh, mouth area, particularly in the most extreme case, uh, the deposition depths would reach more than 100 meter, 108 meter. Then, how we make engineering design decision? Again, go back to the simple question, how to go across uh, the gully? If I put a new a highway bridge, uh, which, is, which exists at, at this time, as a benchmark, then we look at uh, influence zone or deposition depths. Uh, the blue curve represents uh, the actual flood level in, 2000, in year 2000 due to the collapse of Yigong Lanasal Dam. The red curve represents what happened if no diversion channel was excavated. And as a top list, uh, re represent the deposition depths. If all the uh, valid glacier collapse and run down as depth of flow. If I put a more straightforward way, uh, so right here, uh, over down there uh, somewhere, you can see the old bridge, which was destroyed during the flood in 2000, year 2000. And then if I put uh, the new bridge as a benchmark, uh, then essentially the, the new bridge was designed uh, but allow some room okay, above the flood level of the year 2000 uh, actual flood uh, level. If no excavation, okay, if no diversion channel, then the flood level will be well, about 20 meters higher. If all the glacier detach from top of mountain, then the level will be hmm, about 70 meters above the existing bridge. So through such simple analysis, although it's difficult to anticipate whether that can happen, but still, uh, it seems like a bridge plan is not quite feasible. Now, uh, let's try to, re uh, try to remind uh, the recommendation from case one as uh, so risk principle. Uh, when we face larger scale hazard, what we should do, Bypass major hazard, raise elevation. So uh, a natural recommendation for this case would be to bypass major hazard through a tunnel at a sufficient uh, elevation, so, which is, in fact is a solution right now. So in this case, uh, we use uh, stress testing to help anticipate what can happen in the future, and enhance the robustness of engineering design. Finally, um, so I present three cases involving landslide has a chain. Um, we noted that the impact of time, uh, space, and the loss can amplify, sometimes, many times, or thousand times. Imagine uh, the Yangtze River blockage Landslide size, one kilometer, influence zone, 700 kilometers. 
in case one, uh, essentially we adopt a line as you go approach. The effectiveness of risk mitigation measures will evaluate through quantified risk. And the selection of highway alignment elevation uh, was determined based on risk. And in the Young's River Diamond risk case, uh, a proactive risk management protocol was adopted and proved to be timely and success successful. And in the third case, we use stress testing to manage the risk of future extreme events, which we don't fully understand. In all the three cases, I benefit greatly from Dr. Park's line as you go approach. A distinguished engineer has written about rough pack to meet him, to listen to him, to be influenced by him at an early age, helping gifts a value. Uh, indeed, I got a chance to, to meet and listen to Dr. Pak in several Jew congresses in early 2000, 2000, 2001, 2003, 2004. Indeed, to be influenced by Dr. Pak at an early age is a gift I value dearly. With that, thank you so much. Thank you, Lumin. That was great. We're privileged every year to have an amazing slate of lecturers. And, you know, you think to yourself, oh, there must be a year when it's not so great, or we have a dip in the quality. And I don't think that we ever do. And so thanks to our awards committee, especially, I don't think we've given them a shout out all week for choosing the lecturers every year. They do a great job year in and year out. I see a lot of past lecturers here. You're all very high quality lecture, lecturers too. And they all came out of the GI Awards Committee. So I think we should give the Awards Committee a hand for the great work that they do. <laughs> 